So we move on then to our theme for today. We've been thinking this week about the gospel itself, first of all, in the first two days, as God's truth in the person of Jesus and God's reconciling power through the cross of Jesus. And then we went on to think about the world in all the plethora of its religions and the confusion of its needs and its sufferings. But what about ourselves, the church of Christ? What kind of people, as we saw in the video, what kind of people must me be? And that is our theme for today and tomorrow. And I want to thank all of those who responded through the Global Conversation and on the website with your comments uh, to what was put into the Global Conversation on this topic. Uh, they were very interesting and helpful to me as I prepared. And of course, I want to say thank you to our brother Callisto for his marvelous, powerful exposition of God's Word just a few minutes ago. Yes, indeed. Now, in our opening ceremony, do you remember that back last Sunday? It seems an awful long time ago now. Uh, we stepped right back to Pentecost. But of course, the mission of God's people goes back a lot further than that in the Bible. It was about 4,000 years ago that God gave the Great Commission to Abraham, telling him to go, be a blessing, and all nations on earth will be blessed through you. That is God's great mission. That is, in fact, what Paul says in Galatians 3 is the gospel. That is how the Scriptures preach the gospel in advance to Abraham. Through you, all nations will be blessed. But how would that happen? Well, God's plan was that it should happen by God, first of all, creating a people, His own people, a people chosen in Abraham, redeemed through Christ, and a people who were then called upon to walk in the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Marvelous that that verse from Genesis 18 is so picked up by Paul and by Callisto in his exposition this morning. That says God, that's why I chose Abraham, God says, that he would walk in doing righteousness and justice so that all the nations of the earth could be blessed through him. The whole purpose of our election is missional and ethical as Ajit reminded us in his opening exposition of Ephesians 1, that we are called upon to live out the fruit of our predestination by living to the praise of God's glory. Now, God has been keeping that promise to Abraham all through the Bible, of course, as Gentiles came to faith in Christ, both in the Old Testament times into the blessing of Israel and the New Testament times in the Gentile mission. And as we saw in that great historical survey on the first evening, God has been keeping that promise right through the centuries up to today. That's God's great mission, to bring the nations of the world into the blessing of Abraham through our Lord Jesus Christ. But there were many obstacles to God's mission in the Bible and ever since. Many things that keep frustrating and hindering that great, loving, saving mission of God. And we've been thinking about many of them here this week already all the challenges that we seek to overcome as we participate with God in His mission. But what do you think is the greatest obstacle to God's desire for the evangelization of the world? It's not other religions. It's not persecution. It's not resistant cultures. Now, those are all serious challenges. Of course they are. We wouldn't be here if we weren't taking them seriously. But the overwhelming witness of the Bible is that the greatest problem for God in His redemptive mission for the world is His own people. What hurts God most in the Bible, it seems, is not just the sin of the world, but the failure, disobedience, and rebellion of those whom God has redeemed and called to be His people, His holy people, His distinctive people. I wonder if you've noticed, I'm sure you have, that those big books of the prophets in the Old Testament, the vast bulk of their words and the burden of their message was addressed to God's own people, Israel. And only a few chapters, by contrast, are addressed to the nations, the outside nations. And by contrast, we tend to spend all our time attacking and complaining about the world and ignoring our own failures. Think for a moment about Old Testament Israel. God called them to be a light to the nations, said Isaiah. But according to Ezekiel, Israel had sunk even lower than the nations, including Sodom and Gomorrah, 
She has rebelled against my laws even more than the nations and countries around her, says God. God called them into the blessing of redemption and covenant, into the great privilege of knowing the living God and being called to worship Him alone. And yet they constantly went after other gods, falling into repeated idolatry. Idolatry, that is the biggest single obstacle to world mission. It's obvious, really, because if God's mission is to bring all the nations into the blessing of knowing and worshiping and enjoying Him alone as Creator and Redeemer, then the biggest threat to that is the worship of other gods, false gods, no gods. But the problem that we see in the Old Testament is not just the idolatry of the foreign nations and their false gods, but the idolatry of God's own people. Now, there are many false gods, many idols in the world, as Paul tells us, that entice us away from the living God alone. But there are three in particular that seem especially seductive, just as much for evangelical Christians as for Israel of the Old Testament. And these three are, first of all, the idol of power and pride, secondly, the idol of popularity and success, and thirdly, the idol of wealth and greed. And the Old Testament prophets and Jesus and the apostles give us powerful warnings against all three of these terrible idols that so pollute and pervert the mission of God's people. Let's think about them. First of all, the idol of power and pride. Listen to the word of the Lord through Isaiah. He says, the Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted, they will be humbled. The arrogance of man will be brought low and the pride of men humbled and the Lord alone will be exalted on that day and the idols will totally disappear. Or listen to God's great requirement through Micah. What does the Lord require of you? But to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Listen to the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. That's what it's like in the world. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves, because I am among you, said Jesus, as the one who serves. And as we saw in our Bible exposition yesterday, when Paul talks about the life that is worthy of our calling of the gospel, the very first thing he says in Ephesians 4 is, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Sisters and brothers, to be obsessed, even to be concerned at all about status, office, power, in the Christian church and in Christian work is sheer disobedience to Christ and to the Bible. And it destroys the very thing that we're seeking to accomplish. We are called back in repentance to humility. Then secondly, there's the idols of popularity and success. And these are the idols that lead us into manipulation and dishonesty and distortion and exaggeration like the false prophets of the Old Testament, false prophets who were claiming to speak the Word of God, but were really acting in their own self-interest and were claiming to be men of God, but were just giving the people whatever they wanted to hear or see at the time. They were popular. They were successful. Of course they were. But they were false prophets in the grip of a false god. Listen to the Word of God again through Jeremiah. From the least to the greatest of them, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there's no peace. Are they not ashamed of their loathsome conduct? No, they've got no shame at all. They don't even know how to blush. You don't need to feel ashamed. You don't need to blush when you're popular and successful with thousands of followers and a lifestyle to match. And even in the early church, in all its mission, Paul warned those who, he said, peddled, sold the Word of God for profit, those who used deception and distortion, he said. The church, of course, as we read in Corinth, was dazzled 
by these super apostles, as Paul called them, who were boasting of their credentials and their impressive speaking and their great popularity. They were the kind of successful leaders that the church in Corinth wanted to boost their own image in the world of Corinth. But Paul says, such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, Paul goes on, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then, he says, if Satan's servants masquerade as servants of righteousness, but their end will be what their actions deserve. Sisters and brothers, we cannot build the kingdom of God, the God of truth, on foundations of dishonesty. Telling lies about our success, or accepting what we know to be questionable statistics in order to get or to grant funding for our projects is nothing short of bowing down to the idolatry of manipulated success. We are called, we are called in repentance to humility and integrity. And then thirdly, there's the idols of wealth and greed. The idolatry of greed infected the religious leaders of Israel, of course. Listen to the word of God through Micah. He said, her leaders judge for a bribe, and her priests teach for a price, and her her prophets tell fortunes for money. Isaiah in his day, as in ours, saw a whole culture of greed, accumulation, consumerism, and covetousness. Remember, Paul said that covetousness is idolatry. Woe, said Isaiah, woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left and you live alone in the land. Now, of course, we know that God longs to provide abundantly for the resources of His people and promise to do so. But Moses, in the same book of Deuteronomy where that promise is made and who rejoiced in the expectation of that abundance, also warned against the danger of it in verses which are not so often quoted. He said, when you eat and are satisfied and when you build fine houses and settle down and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And Jesus gave the same stern warning. Watch out, he said. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, because a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And neither, he could have added, does his ministry. We are called back in repentance to simplicity. Now, when you look at Jesus again for just a moment, we find that he faced all three of these fundamental temptations from the devil. The devil offered him power and status over all the nations from a high mountain, but Jesus refused it, choosing to worship God alone. Jesus chose the path of humility. And the devil suggested that he should manipulate the crowds by a spectacular death-defying miracle. And Jesus recognized the way Satan was twisting the Scriptures to achieve some success. And Jesus chose the path of integrity in his trust in his Father God. And the devil dangled before him the lucrative prospect of abundant food for himself and for the hungry masses. Turn stones into bread. You could make a fortune for yourself with such a miracle. But Jesus resisted with the scriptural truth that God could provide bread, but human beings need greater food for life than that. Jesus chose the path of simplicity in dependence on the promises of God his Father. So you see, Jesus resisted all these temptations to give in to the false gods that had tempted Israel in the Old Testament. And there he was, 40 days in the wilderness, like Israel, 40 years in the wilderness. Would he resist and be obedient to God? And he did. He was. But tragically, it seems that so many Christian leaders, including mission leaders, blatantly fail these tests at precisely the points that Jesus overcame them. They simply can't resist the temptations of elevated status, of manipulated success, of selfish greed. 
And then, as Callista was reminding us this morning, the whole church pays the cost of their failure in the loss of integrity and credibility. And so, when we even dare to point a finger of criticism at the sin of the world, we are told bluntly and rightly, clean up your own backyard. We are, in short, a scandal, a stumbling block to the mission of God. On that same opening night in our wonderful celebration, we saw the great story of the Reformation in Europe. Why was that needed? Well, you go back to pre-Reformation medieval church in Europe, and you will see these same three idols masquerading through the corrupt ecclesiastical system at that time. There were powerful prince bishops wielding enormous wealth and power. There were shrines and saints that were popular and successful for church income. There were people making their fortune from selling indulgences and exploiting the poor with promises of good things in the life to come. And meanwhile, the ordinary people lived in ignorance of the Bible, which wasn't available in their language and wasn't being preached from their pulpits. And reformation was the desperate need of the hour. Surely, the same desperate need is with us now. And I dare to propose that it needs to begin in the worldwide evangelical community. For there are parts, there are parts of the evangelical church today where these same three idols are being submitted to. There are self-appointed super apostles and mighty elevated leaders, unaccountable to anybody else, popular with thousands of followers, lording it over the flock of Christ, unconcerned for the weak and poor, showing none of the marks of the apostle Paul that he talks about, and with no resemblance to the crucified Christ. That's the idolatry of pride and power. And there is a craze for success and for results and obsession with statistics and outcomes, sometimes leading to wild claims and unsubstantiated numbers and untrue reports and blatant manipulation and collusion in falsehood. That's the idolatry of success. And then there's the so-called prosperity gospel. Now, of course, we affirm that what the Bible says about God's blessing and about the power of God's Spirit and the victory of God over all that crushes and curses human life. But, as Femi will be telling us very soon, many promoters of this teaching distort the Bible, if they use it at all, appeal to human greed, and have no place for the Bible's teaching on suffering and taking up the cross. They succeed only in enriching themselves in a lifestyle that is utterly contrary to the teaching and example of Christ, the idolatry of greed. And meanwhile, as in the pre-Reformation church, the ordinary people of God in so many churches live in ignorance of the Bible with pastors who neither know it themselves or are not willing or equipped to preach it and teach it to their people. Reformation is once again the desperate need of our day, and it needs to start with us. What then must we do? Finally, we need a radical return to the Lord. We need to hear the prophetic word of God from the prophets, from the Lord Jesus Christ, from the apostles of the New Testament. Repent and believe the gospel. And remember, Jesus preached that message, made that command, repent and believe the gospel, not to pagan unbelievers, Gentile outsiders, people of other faiths, but to those who already claim to be the people of God. And so it comes to us as well. Before we go out to the world, we must come back to the Lord. If we want to change the world, we must first change our own hearts and ways, as Jeremiah said. As we take the words of the gospel to the world, we must also, as Hosea said, take with us words of confession to God. And before we get off our seats to speak and seek the lost, we need to get on our knees to seek the Lord. Now, towards the end of our session, we're going to invite you to do these things in prayer before the Lord. We will have a time of prayer, and we'll be asking that where we have been exalting our status and titles, let us walk humbly with our God. For the Lord gives grace to the humble, but puts down the proud. And where we have manipulated or distorted or exaggerated, let us resolve to walk in the light and truth of God. For the Lord looks on the heart 
and is pleased with integrity. And where we have used our ministry for our own selfish ends, let us walk in the simplicity of Jesus, for we cannot serve God and mammon. Three words, humility, integrity, simplicity. I know this won't work in other languages, but it's H-I-S, His. Are we His people? Let us then be what we are for God's sake, for our mission's sake, and for the world's sake. How can we draw together some of the threads of what we've been thinking about and what you've been discussing for the last few minutes? Again and again this week, it seems to us, the message has been heard that our mission demands that the church itself must be an authentic model of what it preaches, that the church must demonstrate a community of reconciled love and unity. And that's not surprising, is it? Because after all, that's what Jesus told us repeatedly four times in his last great conversation with his disciples before his death. In John's gospel, love one another, he said, that's my last command to you. And we've been hearing it again from Paul in Ephesians. But all three of these idolatries that we've been thinking about this morning operate to destroy that unity. In fact, I would suggest that the primary cause of our disunity and our fragmentation is our obsession with these three things. People who build and defend their own status and power are not going to unite in humility with others. And people who've got no integrity in what they do or say can't be trusted to do the costly work of transparency and accountability and unity. And people who are motivated by selfishness will see other Christian ministries as competition. And so you see, humility, integrity, and simplicity are also signposts to unity, the unity that is a precondition of our mission according to Jesus in both His command and His prayer. Again and again this week, we've been hearing, discerning this double challenge coming through of the need for radical, obedient discipleship leading to maturity of growth in depth as well as in numbers and of the need of radical cross-centered reconciliation leading to unity, to growth in love as well as in faith and hope. And both of these things were the command of Jesus and His apostles, and both of them are indispensable to our mission. There is no biblical mission without biblical living.